Hello and welcome to the History of the Germans, episode 119. What is the Hansa? Now, that was the question King Edward IV asked the representatives of the Steelyard in 1469. And he had a good reason to ask, because tensions between the English and the Hansa had escalated. Ships were captured and people got killed. He wanted to know who to negotiate with, and in particular, who could sign a binding agreement that would put an end to this. The answer he got was not very satisfactory. Quote, the Hansa Teutonica is not a societas company, for it knows neither common ownership of goods nor shared ownership of the good, since in the Hansa Teutonica there is no joint ownership. Nor is it a company formed for certain commercial transactions, since in the Hansa Teutonica each individual makes transactions for himself, and the profit and the loss falls on each individual. It is also not a collegium, a college, since it is formed from separate cities. It's also not an universitas, a corporate body, because for that it required to have property, a common treasure, a common seal, a common syndicus, and a recognized leader. The Hansa Teutonica is a firm alliance of many cities, towns, and communities for the purpose of ensuring that commercial enterprises on water and on land have the desired and favorable success and that effective protection is provided against pirates and highwaymen, so that the merchants are not deprived of their goods and valuables by their raids. End quote. Yep, me neither. And for most of history, historians have remained as befuddled as King Edward IV about the nature of the Hansa. Now this being the History of the Germans podcast, ambiguity is nothing we are afraid of. So let's step into the debate and get it wrong on every count. But before we... Aha! I can feel it. You have your finger over the 30-second forward button. Are you sure this is a good idea? Remember last week when you did that and you found yourself in the middle of that horrific rendition of O Tannenbaum? Just think about what else I could do. No, I won't. I won't. I should probably apologize for that singing. It was cruel and, like all real cruelty, somewhat unintentional. I knew it would be quite bad. But listening to it again, once the episode had been published, I realized just how god-awful it was. At which point I have to express my gratitude to all of you who, instead of running away horrified, have decided to go to patreon.com slash historyofthegermans or to historyofthegermans.com slash support and contributed to the show. Your commitment to swap chocolate croissant for mental nourishment goes beyond what could reasonably be demanded. Your names will appear here soon. Though for now, I want to thank Stefan A., Ole F., Friso B., and Albert V., who've already signed up. So, what is the Hansa? To answer that, it may be useful to look at the Hansa in comparison to other European trading organizations, in particular the world of Mediterranean trade, i.e. Venice, Genoa, Pisa, Florence, etc. Both operated in geographically closed oceans the Mediterranean and the Baltic. They transported goods over long distances. And that's pretty much it, because everything else was different. Mediterranean trade was mainly in high-value, low-weight goods. Spices, silk, incense, carpets, glass, all that coming into Western Europe in exchange mainly for silver, as well as for the more pedestrian goods like wine, salt, grain, olives and fish. The Baltic trade, on the other hand, was predominantly in bulky, everyday goods. Herring, rye, stockfish, cloth. The only real luxury items were furs and beeswax, though these themselves were again quite bulky. The Met traders sailed on galleys, who would be rowed wherever the helmsman pointed her at, whilst the Hansards sailed on sailing ships that could not really go upwind, making arrival times and sometimes even arrival locations somewhat unpredictable. Then, the cities around the Mediterranean were in constant competition with each other. The Venetians would attack the Genoese galleys with the same fury as a Muslim one, or maybe with even more vigor. Within the Hansa, that was completely different. The Hansa cities cooperated if they found common ground, and where they didn't, they simply ignored each other. The next point is that Venice and Genoa and Pisa and Amalfi they conquered their trading posts along the Mediterranean and incorporated them into their maritime empires. Some of these, like the islands of Corfu and Crete, were quite sizable in themselves, 
and then in the later stages, Venice in particular would become a significant land-based state, as well as a maritime republic. None of the Hanseatic cities pursued a similar policy. When they went outside their own territory, they did that through their contours, which were embedded into the trading centers of Bruges, London, Bergen and Novgorod. They did go to war, and as we have seen quite successfully, but they usually tried to avoid it, and it was never to gain territory, but to force the princely rulers to confirm their privileges and trading rights. Another major difference was the relative size of the trading firm. In Italy, huge corporations emerged, with representatives in all the major centers from Cairo to Bruges. The owners of these firms became immensely rich and then dominated politics until gradually transitioning to princely rulers, like the Medici in Florence, or to a tight oligarchy as in Venice and Genoa. The Hansa world was mainly made up of medium-sized merchants, where well-educated, ambitious men could rise to the highest positions in their city, whilst sometimes the sons of the successful merchants find themselves relegated to the lower ranks if they lacked the skills required. Now, this is the factual bit. What the discussion has been about for the last 200 years is why it was the way it was. A state like Venice is easy to understand with a modern mindset. The Hanse is not. As the English would say, it is a crocodile. They can only see a small part with the main body and the terrifying jaw hidden from view. And that is why everyone has been interpreting this thing in their own way, reflecting more their contemporary perceptions than the reality of the time. In the 19th century, the Hanse was seen as a German nationalist endeavor. Led by the mighty city of Lübeck, the Hansards formed an organized military power that dominated the North Sea and colonized the Baltic all the way up to Estonia, Sweden and even Finland. And that narrative fit neatly into Kaiser Bill's idiotic ambition to build a German navy rivaling Britain. And on top of that, it provided a bit of colonial tradition, another thing it was felt the nation sadly lacked. This notion was then supercharged during the Nazi regime when the Hansards were painted as German Übermenschen, who together with their fellow Teutonic Knights turned the people of Prussia and along the Livonian coast into slaves providing the foodstuff needed to feed the Germans back home. Now, after the war, two new schools of thought emerged. In East Germany, the Hanse was given the Marxist-Leninist treatment, setting them up as bourgeois proto-capitalists constantly suppressing the uprisings from the lower classes. In West Germany, something rather weird happened. The Hanseatic archive of Lübeck had been brought to safety in East Germany at the time and was later transported to the Soviet Union. That made it hard to access for Western scholars, and as a consequence, research about the Hanseatic League in the West stagnated a bit. In the absence of new research, the pre-war findings kept getting repeated, the archives returned to Lübeck in the early 1990s, and gradually a new wave of research began to emerge. Many a beloved story was put under intense scrutiny, like the story of Klaus Störtebecker we talked about last week. Now this research focused more on the cooperative and the international component of the Hanse. In the public perception, the Hanse turned from a German nationalist project to a predecessor of the European Union. Andres Ansip, Prime Minister of Estonia celebrated the country's entry into the European Union by saying, the EU is a new Hansa. And a new Hansa was even formed, mainly as a marketing association between Hanseatic cities from Belarus to the United Kingdom. But for what it's worth, the Hansa never had the equivalent of a European Council, a European Parliament and the European Commission, which makes it all as believable as the idea that Charlemagne was some sort of love child of Adenauer and de Gaulle. Now, looking at the current iteration of historical writing, we are moving into the next stage, the Hanse as a network. When I first read that, I thought, yes, this is inevitable. We've tried naval superpower, German Übermensch, Marx and Fukuyama's end of history. Natural next step must be that the Hanse is now an early eBay, Amazon or Alibaba. But let's park the cynicism and let me take you through the logic of the Hanse as a network. I rely here mainly on Karsten Janke, Justina wups mrocevic and David Abulafia, the sources you find in the show notes. Where the thinking begins is when we talk about the challenges the Hanseatic merchants faced. The first one is simply distance. 
Let's assume you're based in Lübeck and you're trading between Novgorod and Bruges. That means first you set off for Bruges to buy the cloth. Then you take the cloth to Novgorod where you sell it. You use the proceeds to buy fur or beeswax, which you then bring to Lübeck for sale. That is about six and a half thousand kilometers round trip, which in a cock going at three to four knots per hour and not always in the right direction can easily take a year. Medieval ships, as I said before, could not go to windward, so merchants could find themselves stuck in harbor or blown to places you never wanted to go to in the first place. It was also extremely risky. On the one hand, there are the risks of pirates, confiscation of goods by the local ruler, shipwreck, etc. Plus, you have all your eggs in one basket. This one set of goods you're traveling with. If they are lost or damaged, you will be destitute, and so will be your family. These extreme events are one thing, but there are also less dramatic but equally serious problems. What if the cloth you brought along from Bruges was not what the Novgorodians find fashionable anymore? What if you bring furs to Lübeck just when a whole fleet coming in with Norwegian furs, destroying the prices? What if the city of Bruges is on fire just when you arrive with your beeswax? Around the 14th century, the Hanseatic trade changed in order to minimize these risks. Up-and-coming merchants were still crisscrossing the Baltics with their own wares, but established merchants would settle down in one place and trade across multiple markets. They would buy space on one ship going to Novgorod, on another going to Bergen, whilst buying goods coming in from Narva or Stockholm and then forward them to London. The system diversified the risks, but had other challenges. The merchant could ask the shipper, the captain and owner of the ship, to sell the goods and buy new ones. But how would he be sure that the shipper will not screw him over? Alternatively, he could send an apprentice to travel with the goods. But that apprentice will ask for detailed instructions, which at the time of arrival may already be obsolete. And this does not solve the problem of information discrepancy between the locals and the person trading into the sport. You still do not know whether you have the right fashionable color of cloth. But we do know that the system works, because otherwise we would not have a podcast series about the Hanseatic League. So it may be worth to look at an individual merchant and to understand how it might have functioned. Bernd Pahl was such a merchant. He had based himself in Tallinn, or Rival, as it's called in German, though he was originally from Lübeck. His father had been an important merchant of Lübeck, who had traded with England and Bergen. The Pahl family had been in Lübeck for a long time and had risen to become members of the city council. Amongst the wider family are merchants in Wismar and Dülmen in Westphalia. So Bernd Pahl was born in 1437 and in 1444, i.e. at the age of just seven, he was moved to Tallinn to be apprenticed to a merchant. He's likely to have already learned to read and write, as well as some basic maths, in one of the city schools that had been gradually replacing the monasteries as places of learning. In 1454, he gets admitted to the Society of the Black Hats, the Schwarzenhäupter. That was the association of the unmarried merchants, which comprised those who had been born and bred in Tallinn, as well as foreign merchants passing through. He's now 17, and his career is taking off. Now, he's a lucky guy, because he has some seed financing. His father had remarried, and under Lübeck law, he had to set aside some money for the children of his first marriage in lieu of inheritance. Having seen him being admitted to the Guild of Merchants, his guardians in Lübeck saw it fit to hand him the 800 mark he was owed. And he gets going immediately. He trades in the classic Hanseatic merchandise, cloth and herring. Since nobody yet knows him as an honorable merchant, he needs to have guarantors, one of whom may well have been the merchant where he had been apprenticed. And another connection is made. He is appointed as the Tallinn representative of Thomas Grote, a member of the city council in Lübeck. Three years later, Bernd Pahl goes to Novgorod for a season, where he is likely to have met more Hansards from different cities. These connections seem to have come in useful when he gets going properly in around 1460. The size of his operations keeps growing and so is his standing inside Tallinn. 
he is even made treasurer of the Society of the Black Hat. Now his father died in 1469 and so Bernd Pahl returns to Lübeck, where he quickly gains another foothold. With the help of his extended family, he is admitted to the fraternity of St. Anthony and to that of St. Lawrence. He is made the guardian of one of his nephews who had, like him, left for Livonia as a minor. And in Lübeck he keeps trading on the route from Novgorod via Tallinn and Riga to Lübeck and then onwards to London and Bergen. In 1477 or 1478 he moves back to Tallinn. He is now 32. And at that age he should have been married. But for whatever reason that never happens. And that might have hampered his career. Because despite his promising start in Tallinn, he does not progress to the upper echelons. Because he had remained unmarried, he cannot be admitted to the Great Guild, the natural progression for a successful merchant. He also does not gain access to any of the great fraternities or societies where merchants get together. His business continues at roughly the same scale that he had reached in his late 20s. He died in 1503, aged 66, probably after having had a mild stroke a few years earlier. When he died, the value of his inheritance came to 1,506 marks. In other words, Bernd Pahl was a mid-level to slightly upper-level merchant who did preserve the money he had inherited, but failed to reach the level of success his father had achieved. But despite his modest profile, he had a number of companies with important partners as well as a dense network of friends and colleagues across the Baltic. So thanks to his family connections, he was close to the Greverade family in Lübeck, who were a large and very successful clan. Bernd Pahl had a merchant company with Hinrich Graverade II, the head of that family group and the founder of one of the earliest banks in the Hanseatic market. This company traded herring and silver between Lübeck, Tallinn and Narva. Then he had a second company, which did the whole route from Bruges to Narva, which he ran with two other partners, one of whom was based in Bruges. Then he had a company with again another partner trading weapons and another serving the Danzig Tallinn route trading hops and butter and hemp. And finally a last company again with another cousin trading with Bergen. But these partners weren't the only people he dealt with. Beyond the partners in his company there were other merchants he was in constant contact with. And these were quite a few. He had about 15 trading associates in Tallinn, 5 in Dorpat, 5 or 6 in Narva, and smaller numbers in Danzig, Stockholm, Novgorod, Bergenov, Zom, and Antwerp. That kind of network meant that Bernd Pahl was capable to procure pretty much any merchandise you could ask for him from these various locations. And that's great, but you have to remember that's quite rare that a customer would go to a merchant and ask him to get a few tons of herring or wood or whatever shipped. That process was simply too time-consuming given the distances. What happened much more often was that the merchant would send wares to a place in the hope that there would be demand. And that is where the network like the one Bernd Pahl maintained came in handy. First up, it means you can send wares to your business partner in, say, Antwerp and have him sell it there on behalf of the company. Your partner is a local with local connections and good understanding of what price can be achieved. So, he should be able to get a good deal on that merchandise. But then, Antwerp was a long way away, and how could you be sure that your business partner kept his goods and the company's goods neatly separated, professionally stored, and sold at the correct price? Now, that is where these various other associates come in. They're expected to keep an eye on your business partner, making sure he stays on the straight and narrow. And, mostly, that is what Hanseatic merchants did. The constant social control, the knowledge that if you let down your trading partner, you will hear about it, worked. The other thing these associates and partners were extremely helpful with was the exchange of information. Every time a merchant would send goods to his partner or associate, he would enclose a letter. These letters would not contain just news about the other merchants in town, but also general information about the state of the market, whether there was a shortage of hops whether the Church of St. Mary urgently needed wood for repairs, whether there were pirates out in the Sound, whether there is a new tax regime, and to close, some gossip about family affairs, who's marrying who, who died, who was negotiating with who about marriage, etc., etc. Basically, the content of the Financial Times with Hello Magazine inside. 
these letters produced a constant and robust flow of information. Hanseatic merchants were busy all day collecting and processing information that they would then feed back into the network. The system had a lot of redundancy, as the same information may be distributed by several merchants of the network. And that is exactly what made that system much faster and much more resilient. If Bernd Pahl was waiting for news from Nauva, there were six ships coming down to him in Tallinn, and whichever was the fastest would bring the information. And even if one of them was blown off course or, got behold, sank, the news would still get through. Yes, it's exactly like the internet. Information is copied and then sent through multiple routes to the recipient to ensure it definitely arrives. What that also meant is that the larger one's network, the better the information, the higher the chance of making good money. So every merchant was constantly trying to grow the network. And how do you do that? Well, information is the currency that keeps the network going. So you have to have good information. You have to share that information so that people want to join your network. And as you grow your network, your information becomes better. And so more people want to join your network and so forth and so forth. But this isn't Twitter. These guys do not just send messages back and forth for likes and retweets. They're traders. They want to see some business in return for all that letter writing and surveillance. So, to maintain the network, the merchants also need to occasionally send trades to associates who are not their primary business partners. Now, another way to increase the strength of the network was to join the various merchants' clubs and fraternities. Being a member of the confraternity of St. Anthony or St. Lawrence in Lübeck does not just mean you get to worship in the church. It also means you're invited to the dinners and meetings where people will talk shop. Because if you write letters all day, talking shop is second nature. Other famous merchant associations were the Artushof in Danzig and my personal naming favorite, the Circle in Lübeck. If you get in there, you're made. But you have to have made it to get in. Again, there is no free lunch. If you want to receive the information, you also need to share the information. And so it flows and flows and flows. The last leg to become a seriously successful merchant is to get onto the city council. That is where you get all the really juicy information. Will there be a naval expedition to put down pirates? Has the King of England really decided to strike back? Will the Duke of Burgundy cave on the question of privileges in Bruges? That is the sort of information that makes and saves fortunes. The difference that made was significant. Take another Italian merchant, Hans Zellhorst who didn't make it all the way into the city council and become a major player in the Great Guild and all the other societies. He left behind 8,177 mark, or 5.5 more than Bernd Pahl when he passed away. But it was still only factor 5.5. If you think about the gulf in wealth between a Medici and an average Florentine trader or banker, or between Jakob Fugger and his colleagues, then a factor of 5.5 does not appear a huge multiple. The reason for the relatively small differential might have been the structure of the network. Because each merchant needed more than one, ideally more than five associates, in each of the cities he was trading with, that means that even smaller merchants would gain an occasional piece of business from the number one trader in another city. It also meant that an ambitious and aggressive player could not just open a branch in another city and thereby expand his share of the value chain. The branch manager would never be allowed into the important societies, let alone on the city council, meaning he would never get the really juicy gossip. Plus, the existing associates would likely cut off any merchant who pursued such aggressive tactics. And that meant Ambitious merchants could not build trading empires with branches everywhere from Venice to Bergen and Narva to Antwerp. It also forced a level of honesty amongst the merchants. Sending false information or mishandling your trading partner's goods would be easily picked up by their fellow merchants and they would inform the other party. Such a merchant would then be excluded from the broader network and his business would operate at a massive information disadvantage. The legendary honorable Hanseatic merchant, the Ehrbare Kaufmann, isn't honest because he fears God or because he has a conscience, he is honest because the downside of dishonesty is simply too large. 
These features of the network explain a couple of other particularities of the Hansa too. Because each merchant was in a symbiotic relationship with other merchants in other cities, the cities were prone to cooperate rather than to fight each other. And where the cooperation would be harmful to an individual city, the way to deal with it was by simply not coming to the Hansetag, the Hanseatic diet where the issue would be discussed. And if that happened, the cities that were keen to take action would pretend nothing was amiss, at least as long as the dissenters did not proactively undermine the initiative. There wasn't an official list of Hanseatic cities, no capital, no foundation treaty, no common seal or permanent bureaucracy. Even the Hanseatic diets were only attended by a few dozen cities at best, never the famous 77 full members and 200 small members. Decisions of the Hanseatic diet weren't binding. And that wasn't only in case the city had not sent a delegate. A delegate was completely within his rights to declare that he could not vote on this decision, as he did not have an explicit instruction to do so from back home. Afterwards, the city in question would convey its answer to the diet, which could be that they would not participate in whatever initiative had been proposed. And there were no repercussions. So why such a loose structure? Imagine the Hansetag chooses to go to war with England over the merchant adventurers breaking the rules of the game in the Baltic. That may be the right decision for Gdansk, Stralsund and the Wendish cities who are suffering from the English competition. But for Cologne or Bremen it could be fatal. They depend much more on the trade with England directly and have no beef with the merchant adventurers in the Baltic. In the original Hansa system, they could just pretend nothing happened. And that would be that. They would still trade with England on a probably somewhat reduced level, and they wouldn't interfere with the war effort. But if Cologne or Bremen had been forced to participate, the situation could have quickly spun out of control, with the two cities leaving the league. And once key staging posts in the network are lost, the whole system weakens until it finally collapses which is pretty much what happened when this situation arose in 1469. So it sort of all links up. The network effect is what created the cooperative model of a loose federation of the cities, the cities that were inhabited by medium-sized individual merchants who had no territorial ambitions. A structure that was so fundamentally different to the situation in the Mediterranean, which was dominated by city-states that were themselves controlled by large international trading houses who slowly but surely turned into princes. As I said before, I really like the theory about how the Hansa worked. The only thing that stops me in my tracks is that it sits so neatly in the historiography. Maybe we are again projecting our world into the rather malleable world of trading in the Baltic during the High Middle Ages. That wouldn't have been the first time. So from first time to next time. Next time we'll look at the years following the wars with Denmark and the Victual brothers. The Hanse is at the height of its powers, but storm clouds are gathering. First all the way east in Novgorod, but then the herrings move. I hope you're going to join us again. Now before I go, just a big thank you to all my patrons who kindly keep the show on the road. I really, really appreciate your generosity. And if you want to join, there is still a chance to grab one of these unlimited patron subscriptions at patreon.com slash historyofthegermans or at historyofthegermans.com slash support. So and finally the bibliography. I would like to add a few works to our usual list. In particular, Carsten Janke, Die Hanse, and again Carsten Janke, Netzwerke in Handel und Kommunikation an der Wende vom 15. zum 16. Jahrhundert am Beispiel zweier Gewaler Kaufleute. Justinia Wups Mrozovic and Stuart Yanks editors the Hanse in Medieval and Early Modern Europe. And finally, The Boundless Sea, A Human History of the Oceans by David Abulafia. Mm -hmm.